Good afternoon, and welcome to the IFBTA's member webinar series. I'm Rob Grimes, the CEO of the IFBTA, and today we're very pleased to have our series put on by Squirrel. And Squirrel is going to be talking about a restaurant survival guide, and I would tell you that they are right in the thick of it because a lot of their customer base is actually within the full service and the fast casual space, which clearly have had a lot of challenges. So they have a very unique perspective to share with us today. A couple of housekeeping things for us uh, to know about. At the bottom of your screen is a Q&A tab. During this session, you can go ahead and list questions on the Q&A tab, which some may be answered as we go along. But at the end, we're going to go ahead and actually do a live Q&A with the members of our panel. And then uh, we'll be using the questions that you submit in order to ask them. So please use the Q&A tab uh, in order to do that. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn over uh, this presentation to Penn Clark, who is the Director of Brand and Content Marketing for Squirrel. Thank you very much, Rob. I'll share my screen. There we are. Um, so thank you, Rob. <clears throat> We're going to talk today about sort of how things have changed in the market and um, how we've seen some customers transition to weather the storm. A uh, little intro, uh, my name is Ben Clark, I'm the Director of Brand and Content here at Squirrel. Um, joining me is Patrick Paris, who's a Solution Engineer, and Tim Dumais, who's a Manager in our Solution Engineering team, as well as Mark Brando, the Market Intelligence Manager with Data Essentials, uh, who's very kind to join us today. <clears throat> so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark, who's gonna walk us through some numbers. Uh, Penn, thanks so much for that introduction, and thanks for having Data Essential on. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. I think that the way for us to start talking about, uh, you know, how things are going to, to be going forward is to take a, a look at where things kind of stand right now. Um, so one of uh, Data Essential's uh, uh, big applications that we, we use in all of our research is our Firefly platform which is just a, a large database of uh, every restaurant and food service uh, location that we can find listings for uh, in the United States and in Canada. Um, we've been tracking, uh, you know, it, it, in the first month of this uh, crisis, it was, it was tracking all the closures of, of restaurants and different restrictions being put in by uh, states and provinces. Uh, but since uh, this was last collected on uh, April 30th, we now luckily get to start tracking openings uh, across uh, both the United States and Canada um, and an easing of restrictions. And uh, what, what these maps here you have in front of you show is just that, you know, it's going to be kind of a, a patchwork here. It's, it's not going to be just like flipping a, a switch back on. Um, you know, it's going to be kind of uh, varied from province to province and state to state. You know, in, in uh, Canada, it looks like Alberta and Manitoba are um, a little bit out in front of the rest of the provinces, but um, you know, even then, they're still being pretty cautious uh, about you know 50% capacity in those two provinces uh, starting this week. And uh, I believe we we're saying on on the discussion of all the presenters before, it'll still be another couple of weeks before most of the other provinces catch up. In the United States, it's kind of even even more varied. You know, you see these uh, pale states here of Alaska, Texas, Florida. Um, they are reopening their dining rooms, but only at 25% capacity. The ones there in gold are opening up for dine-in, but only for outdoor seating. And then, you know, uh, half the states are still kind of on lockdown. The other half are trying to open up, but it's, it's a, a pretty varied thing, um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, what the, what the regulations are going to be. So on the next slide, if you could advance it for me, Penn. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, on this on this next slide here, uh, this is uh, a survey of of what Data Central can uh, track in terms of consumers' restaurant behavior by asking them what they actually you know did the day before to uh, get a meal from a restaurant. Uh, so this is a, a thousand consumers only in the United States. So it, um, it doesn't have any Canadian uh, consumer info, but I think that it does kind of apply. The systems are, are um, they're, they're both pretty uh, accurate and, and, and pretty close, I think. 
So uh, the good news is that we have um, increased our usage of restaurants from the start of, of uh, COVID to now. Uh, so from March 25th to April 30th, uh, we're up about nine percentage points in terms of people who actually uh, got food from a restaurant yesterday. You know, two in five consumers um, using restaurants to get, get food, that compares to about, about 50% of consumers um, that we would notice uh, in the times we did this survey before COVID. So we're not all the way back yet, but we are, we're getting there and, and the recovery is on. But some things are pretty different. I think um, the, the, big, the big changes um, from before coronavirus to now consistently has been that dinner is now the most used day part uh, for, for restaurants. You know, now that things are primarily a delivery and, and takeout proposition, um, we are uh, kind of switching our behaviors a little bit. And so dinner has uh, gained quite a bit at the expense of uh, certainly breakfast and, and snack time. Uh, you can see here that uh, limited service restaurants are the ones that kind of have been the benefit of all of this. At first, that was because those were the um, restaurants more likely to be open for one thing. Um, and initially, uh, quick service and fast counter restaurants were better set up to make this transition to uh, delivery and carry out. For one thing, a lot of them already had the drive through, which is a big option right now. Uh, a lot of the uh, limited service chains had already made those investments in, uh, you know, third party delivery, uh, advertising their, their carry out options. And so fast casual, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, full service was kind of on the back foot a little bit, but they have since, I think, made some inroads. So overall, I think limited service uh, chains have kind of um, gained some share from full service and especially from shuttered independent locations. But, uh, you know, full service, I think, has, has made some good progress from the start of COVID to now. Um, all the traffic is pretty much outside the dining room right now. And uh, one other thing we see here on the right column uh, of this of this screen is that um, you know folks are still uh, taking things very cautiously. Uh, the experience doesn't feel completely safe uh, for about half of people right now. Uh, but I think that uh, at least American consumers are feeling pretty optimistic. Most of them are saying that they'll be able to eat back in restaurants like before in about three to six months. So uh, these next two slides are just, uh, I'll go through them really quickly just to sort of show you how things are tracking. Uh, the first thing that we have been asking everybody, uh, every survey that we fielded during this pandemic is uh, how concerned they are with their own personal health and safety as it relates to contracting coronavirus. And, um, you know, at first it was, it was pretty high for an initial uh, fielding of two out of five people, but you see that first real big dramatic spike uh, in that chart that was right around March 11th when everything kind of uh, was elevated to everybody's awareness, you know, the day that Tom Hanks got it and the day that uh, the NBA uh, canceled the season and the WHO declared a pandemic. So that was where the initial real spike in concern was. The other spike right there on April 1st was after, uh, you know, a, a pretty harrowing uh, White House briefing where projections were, you know, as many as... Uh, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths and millions of cases in the US um, if we didn't do social distancing. But uh, that's come back down and, and we see it really starting to fall now. The, uh, and, and the next one we see the, you know, avoided behavior, you know, avoiding dining out. It was, uh, it was very low to begin with because this was before uh, a lot of states moved to close their dining rooms. And of course uh, it uh, rose pretty sharply after dining in was, um, you know, disallowed in a lot of places. We had to keep asking the same question about avoiding eating out um, to sort of be able to track the progress with, with you know, data integrity. But uh, consumers did take it to mean, um, you know, avoiding using restaurants at all uh, and then avoiding just dining in. It didn't really reflect how much they were uh, you know, comfortable with, with going to this delivery and, and carry out model. And now at the end of it, you know, it's starting to, to inch back down as well. But on this chart that you see here, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all super gung ho about it. Um, you know, only, only one out of five of us uh, is sort of ready to get back to 
dining in uh, right away. And we don't necessarily know what that's going to look like. Um, restaurant to restaurant, it'll change whether the servers are wearing masks and gloves or not, um, the degree to which they're social distancing, um, the degree to which they want to, you know, offer contactless payment and digital convenience like that, which I'm sure the other panels will get into. This chart here is kind of just another way to look at it, where we asked the same question in another survey, just a little bit of a different way, you know, how would you feel about uh, dining in right now if all of the restaurants were throwing open their doors today? And again, one in five say they have absolutely no problem, uh, but two out of five of us, uh, this was asked right around May 1st, or just before May 1st, actually. Um, people are saying there is no way you can get me to dine in right now. And that was uh, higher among some of the older demographics. But uh, on this next slide that we'll see from me, um, really what it kind of comes down to is that folks are really looking for a, uh, you know, a, a convenient technology enabled uh, takeout experience right now. It's still a really appealing option for a lot of people. So we've asked this question a couple of times uh, through this, this uh, pandemic and um, from the first time to uh, just more recently, which I believe this was uh, late April, the last time we asked this question, um, you know, what would motivate you to get food from restaurants during this crisis and not dine in, but uh, you know, use a restaurant in any way that's available to you, mostly you know, delivery or a carryout model. Um, you know, there's good news here, I think, for full service restaurants especially, because the top option has been, um, you know, if you let me, uh, you know, order takeout now or, you know, a digital sale of delivery or, or something to go now, but give me, you know, uh, a voucher or a, or a, you know, coupon or a gift card to be redeemed later for dining in, that's been really appealing. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, uh, it speaks to the importance of um, digital channels and uh, carry out now, but uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for the experience in the dining room once we're all able to get back into it. And, uh, you know, some of these other convenient, um, convenient touches are gonna impact different demographics differently, um, but expanded delivery zones, it's popular with about one third of us and it's especially popular uh, with parents, you know, there, it's it's hard to you know leave our kids um, you know at home. So if we're teaching them or watching them, we can't really. Um, we're a little bit more homebound that way. So uh, if there are more uh, restaurants in our kind of radius to get delivery from, that would be great. And then uh, for singles, especially, they are really into the idea of expanded delivery hours. So it all just kind of uh, goes to this this uh, notion that. I don't think the importance of uh, dining in is gonna go anywhere. Um, and I don't think that the importance of all of these uh, expanded uh, carry out and delivery options are gonna go away either. We're just not uh, in a huge rush to get right back into the dining room. I think we want to get there eventually, but there's gonna be a pretty long um, interregnum where uh, you know folks wanna be using restaurants. It's just maybe not on premise. So everything that the other panelists are gonna talk about now um, I think it's going to be salient for, for quite a while. Thanks very much, Mark. <clears throat> so, uh, as Rob mentioned in Squirrel, we're primarily, um, a, a large percentage of our customers are, uh, full service, table service. And, you know, one of the things we've seen is, um, about 20% roughly of our, our customer base has uh, shut the doors temporarily. Um, the remaining 70% have really pivoted to a takeout and delivery. So what does reopening require? Well, you know, as Mark showed, the different markets are opening at different rates, but a commonality is, you know, support for low contact dining, um, a continued focus on off-premise service, uh, and really a shift towards some of the technology that's perhaps been around a while, but hasn't gained as much traction, such as contactless payment. Um, so just another slide from Data Essentials, just showing that, you know, I think um, when you're talking about something like contactless payment, you know, roughly 87% of the, the people surveyed really uh, like it, 40% absolutely require it. Um, and similarly, you know, people are looking at uh, disposable menus as a preferable option or disinfected menus and surfaces as sanitized. So there's definitely a consumer push, uh, even as the reopening happens. Um, 
So what does this all mean? Well, it, it requires uh, establishments to have a bit of a shift in focus, right? And develop these capabilities for off-premise and contactless dining. And, and you know, we've seen um, a number of our customers be able to pivot a little bit faster uh, because they are already focused or moving down the road. Uh, for instance, we've got a large multi-unit here in um, Canada who was already looking at expanding their takeout capabilities uh, and some of their alternate service models. And so when the pandemic crisis broke out, they were able um, to leverage their expertise a little bit faster, and that enabled them to to um, smooth out the revenue bump that most of us are seeing. Before we dive right into things, uh, just a quick discussion around third-party delivery aggregators and services. Um, you know, many of you probably already have relationships with these providers, and the, the, you know they're an interim solution. They they provide uh, delivery capabilities. But it, it does come at a fairly high cost. Uh, I mean, certainly in the media and and this is in this audience, we all know that the per order fees, uh, if you're using these services for both ordering delivery, puts huge pressure on margins. And this is not a big margin industry. Uh, we all operate at relatively narrow margins, so that's that's never a good thing. Um, as importantly, it adds a lot of chaos to your kitchen. So if you're you know, working with four or five uh, delivery aggregators and you're re-entering orders um, with multiple iPads, that introduces a lot of errors uh, potentially. And and uh, as importantly, um, it's also that direct relationship with the customer. And so throughout this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit on how to mitigate uh, some of these uh, downsides and, and some potential alternatives to working with uh, third-party aggregators. Um, one of the first places we're going to start is talking about loyalty programs. So loyalty programs are something that a lot of restaurants um, have some experience with. Um, many of our customers have not implemented a loyalty program either because uh, they had other priorities or they felt that it wasn't suitable for their brand. Um, but a good loyalty program is really uh key in being able to develop and maintain a relationship with your customers. And it's not something that has to be uh, implemented in entirely all at once. It can be done incrementally. Where you begin is by knowing your customers. So, you know, starting a customer database where uh, you know uh, name, email address, potentially phone number, key dates are really good. So if you can capture customer birthdays or anniversaries, uh, and how all this data is stored in a system that's already integrated with your establishment because you want to be able to uh, integrate it with uh, incoming orders and payments. Um, and if you give them a way to help you, we you know we know uh, from the the market research we've seen that customers really want restaurants to survive. Guests really love their restaurants. so there's there's an impetus for them. Uh, and if you make it easy for them to sign up, uh, potentially integrated with your website, if you already have online ordering, some sort of way to get them uh, to add uh, a loyalty membership to their profile. Um, and, you know, most people will respond fairly well to incentives such as, uh, you know, a takeout discount or a free side dish uh, with the sign up. Um, and then having a reward program. So, you know, we're all familiar with these. Um, it's been something that the the uh, quick service industry has uh, capitalized on uh, fairly early, but having some sort of point system where, you know, for purchases, you can gain a certain number of points and those are then redeemable in the future. Um, all of this allows you to build that channel with your customer um, and communicate with them, whether that's, you know, via social media or email or text. Um, and the requirements are, are not super significant. This technology exists today. We have uh, uh, capabilities in our products and we work with a lot of partners and there's a lot of vendors that are able to get people up and running quite quickly. Um, loyalty programs can maybe seem a little bit daunting. And I guess the big message here is it's, um, it's become more important than ever to develop that relationship with your guests and it can be done relatively incrementally. Uh, it doesn't have to, to be a big thing. It can start small and grow. Um, you know, and and just a couple real quick statistics. I mean, um, 
somewhere in the 60% of guests who are engaged via loyalty programs spend more than guests that aren't. So there, there's definitely a return here. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick, who's going to talk uh, about some of the ordering and payment solutions that are uh, we're seeing customers leverage. So as we all know, ordering is the one of the most critical parts of service today. And guests are looking for different ways to control the experience, whether it's online, an app, or via third party. Consumers want to be able to order food products regardless of where they are and what they find easiest at the time, like tablets or computers. Omni-channel ordering and payment processing capabilities have quickly become a must-have for off-premise service because they give us these options. And so on that of COVID-19, we as a company have worked with our customer base that is heavily on-premise dining on a remote ordering platform. We have currently been able to onboard over 400 locations to online ordering and over 100 locations so far this month alone. Now, for the restaurant or restaurant tour, this convenience can come with a variety of ups and downs. To best control the overall process and experience, look at a simple online ordering page, hosted website, or a link to your company website. This can be a straightforward method. A couple of things that should be considered. How does the online populated or updated? Ideally, this is automated so that changes to the POS system are reflected online without any input processes. How are modifiers, add-ons, and zero-cost items handled? Ensuring that guests can include cutlery, condiments, napkins, and other tools while easily ordering add-ons or modifying items is an important component of online ordering. What is the order workflow? Best case is that we'll go into your point of sale and be sent to the kitchen as normal via printers or kitchen video, then into the final packaging as efficiently as possible. What processes um, are the options and guest payments for online and in store? Online payments speed up many processes and reduce the content and delivery orders. Now, the downside of online ordering is that it doesn't this experience, so many of us have always provided or a real ability to upsell. This is now part of our new normal. In some cases, we've seen customers have real success with kiosks, which allow for quick in-person purchases with a personal device without a physical kiosk, or in many cases, even enter the premise. By putting a poster with a QR code or NFC tag on a window, on a sandwich board, and on a website, that's can allow guests to view the menu, order, and pay on their own mobile device of choice. Today, many solutions are entirely browser-based, which means they don't require downloading an app um, and are integrated with the point of sale, so orders flow as if they had been entered on a terminal by the staff. Similar to the ordering, these solutions can be configured so they pull the menu from the point of sale and same menu items, add-ons, modifiers, and order flow that an on-prem solution can provide. On that note, we actually have a term multi-unit customer that's very formal service. It's actually looking into options for a completely touchless process. The customer being able to use their own device to place the order, do it at the end, see all of the menus, do everything there without much server interaction. The interesting part about this is this is something that this customer would have absolutely not considered previous to the COVID-19 um, because it's complete off-brand. So currently, and depending on your region, this is now the new normal of ours, and we are already seeing restaurants open in a variety of capacities. We're seeing no cash, carry out only, drive through only at certain locations, limited dining room availability, and we're even seeing some locations today going back to the pre-regular operational standards. Now, here in Nashville, we're actually seeing uh, one of our longtime customers be able to achieve 70% of their pre-COVID sales targets with only 50% of their dining room being able to open. This is due to a heavy continued focus on online ordering and takeout. Touchless service is a very big part of their operational standard today and going forward. Now, however, this doesn't mean these verticals will return to the pre-COVID-19 standards. A few things that we should all consider as we move forward. Menus. Do we shift away from standard menus that are not easily sanitized? Should we consider one-time use menus or menus that are easily and visibly sanitized? Shared devices and terminals. Staff members are at particular risk for some businesses. It may take a sense to shift away from shared or fixed terminals to devices that are assigned to one staff member for a shift, then cleaned and sanitized afterwards. This could, in some cases, better support large dining venues and outside patios. Guest self-service. 
Similar to our virtual kiosk, the solution could allow a guest to order and pay from their own mobile device, which would reduce the contact points throughout the service process. Of course, then tap and NFC payments. For several reasons moving forward, uh, will mean supporting and providing contactless payments. This will possibly be a significant requirement for reopening a dining room in many regions. So now managing a new and much larger number of order entry points can of course create new challenges for operators. Second touch or re-entering orders from iPads and other electronic sources is slow and prone to error. It causes operational issues and introduces several error points. All of this can cost you time, money, and customers. These more complex scenarios are handled with omni-channel POS integration, online ordering, third-party services, self-service kiosk, and mobile app ordering, and some payments can all be funneled directly into the Squirrel POS and then managed efficiently. Integrations like this can reduce the errors introduced by reeking orders from third-party services and help reduce costly mistakes, while also expanding the capabilities of your organization. Now, I'd like to introduce Tim DeMay, who will be discussing the fulfillment process with takeout and delivery. Thank you, Patrick. We're going to get into the fulfillment side of it with the takeaway and deliveries. You know, ordering and payments are two-thirds of the experience. The last part is, how do the guests get their food? In the short term, most squirrel sites have moved to a strictly takeout and delivery model. So we'll be focusing, discussing those. Although as the industry starts to reopen, our customers will also continue to offer the takeout and delivery options. Where in the past, a lot of them would be just full table service. So the first what we're going to talk about is takeout. And first thing we what you want to do is optimize your menu. Keep your menu short to the items that you can afford to, to offer to for the takeout. You're already on a short staff, so it would be essential to keep most of your takeout friendly and low cost, more profitable items on that menu. Pick out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pick takeout friendly food that maintains good quality when it's traveling. Keep the menu short and think about possibly using menu items that share a lot of the same ingredients. So keep it simple if you decide to offer the online ordering. The next piece is streamline your workflow. Reassign workers to takeout delivery focus. You know, watch your food inventory and your purchasing purchasing when orders for the raw food and also the pre-made food inventory because it's all changed because of the menu items that you're concentrating on. You don't want to have too much inventory on hand or items that you or ingredients that you don't need to for those menu items. Also, when you have a flood of food orders, it can be confusing to keep track of completed orders and those in progress. So look at ways to have the ordering solution that are use to have the ability to defer the orders until a later time or some type of scheduling coming in. Also, one of the tips that we recommend for the packaging side, if your POS system can handle the restick labels that you can uh, attach to the food containers or bags, that will be a, a bonus. You know, with the packaging side, you know, you want to set up the printers to automatically print the labels that have the customer information on it, like name and address, content, cutlery, condiments, you know, and possibly have a summary for the bag. You know, one of our large multi-unit customers realized that packaging was an area impacted by the guest experience significantly in the takeout. Knowing the contents are accurate, the bag has been sealed, and that the orders have been reviewed prior to the pickup is equivalent to the server or expediters checking the order before it runs out to the table in fine service. Dining. So the next piece that I'll discuss is the delivery side of it. We talked about a third party aggregators at the beginning, but it's worth noting that the delivery is probably going to continue as an important service model for many of the restaurants. Some of our customers have decided to implement first-party delivery with their own drivers utilizing the Squirrel CRM delivery module. This is a good way to offset some of the costs and drawbacks of the third-party service, but it doesn't make sense for everybody. Still, so there's a couple of solutions to manage delivery better. Looking at integrating a solution that supports delivery rails. This allows your business to keep the ordering process in-house via phone, website, mobile apps, or virtual kiosks, and use the third-party service specifically or simply for the delivery of the order. 
This has a couple of benefits. It keeps the customer relationships between you and your customers and instead of the third party and the customer. In most cases, the commission fee on delivery is much lower than the whole transaction fee if it occurred off-site. As we've highlighted, we've talked about ordering, putting in omni-channel order management capabilities to allow third-party services to flow into your POS and through into the kitchen like any other order. This doesn't reduce the financial cost of the service, but greatly reduces the workload for your staff and potentially errors that occur, particularly in support of several third-party aggregators. And I'm going to turn it back to Penn for a summary. Thank you, Tim. So uh, the takeaway here is that not every solution is applicable to every business. Um, you know, we realize that there's a wide, wide range of types of service and, you know, um, operators have really fine-tuned their business to provide a certain guest experience. And what we're hoping that people take away from this is that even in a environment like this, by developing capabilities in some of these areas, takeout delivery, uh, online ordering, contactless payment, and loyalty programs, you can find a mix using technology that exists today uh, to try and offset some of the impacts that this crisis has had on the industry and to develop capabilities that'll serve you well going into the future. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob uh, and we can do some Q&A. So of course, the, the challenge when you have a complete presentation like that from, from data and then the experiences uh, in the different areas is that it takes uh, quite a bit of time to get through it. And you guys covered a lot of ground. So I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, let's just take one of the questions that came in. Uh, you know, is, is there uh, some advice that you would give to restaurants that are in hotels, how they can better adapt and survive in times like these? Because, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's really a, um, a challenge. You know, obviously, when you're in a hotel, you're even more removed, and you have a different audience that that doesn't may not come back even longer than the restaurants. I'm um, sure happy to. You know, I think that there's some different options depending on um, the providers that are out there. There are certainly a lot of groups now that have the ability to do room service where you're not having to actually use the phone in the property, but can use your personal device um, to actually get those orders in, and then have a more robust menu or a slightly different menu um, available through that portal. So I think that that would be one of the groups to look at, at being able to do a web-based uh, piece for online ordering, just so people could be more comfortable ordering with their personal device, especially if they haven't brought sanitizing wipes and things for the hotel, which I think a lot of people will be doing now. Uh, but that would be one option that you could really consider with that, um, as well as them not having to handle a menu and knowing whether it's been clean, having all that on their personal device could help out quite a bit. Great. So let me just ask one more question um, that came in early. Uh, are there any tips or suggestions for people who are actually opening up a new restaurant, uh, you know, or uh, uh, opening up a new restaurant post, uh, you know, reopening? So, you know, is there tips that you might have, uh, you know, for somebody who's in that situation? Well, one of the things that you really got to look at is the region that you're in as far as what your <coughs> – what the regulations are for opening up, what your staff has to wear, um, all the sanitizing and stuff like that. So you get to really kind of look at your region. You know, here in Washington State is a little different than what Patrick is is um, seeing in Tennessee. So I think you need to do some research on what your local uh, – um, rules are around opening up and in, in um, really start making some checklists as far as do you have that the products the sanitizers the the wipes the you name it that is coming out of all the different regulations going forward yeah absolutely and i would also throw in there that really take a look at who your demographic is and who you're trying to traffic to your establishment um, depending on those groups will depend on how tech, tech savvy they are um, and then what the best route for you to go is it an app is it more of 
just scan a uh, code and it takes them directly to the website. Um, so take a little bit of time just to look at your demographic and who you're trying to draw in so that you can focus on the technology to best uh, support that group. Great. And with that, uh, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. I want to thank uh, Squirrel uh, for being our spotlight webinar today. Uh, just a last comment that just sort of came to mind that, you know, you can't do this all by yourself. And clearly, Squirrel is working in a market segment that has been very much challenged, not just the full service, but also the hotels uh, where they're a leader. And one thing you can do, which is demonstrated by the conversation today, is that they really are the experts and they're keeping an eye on what's going on out there and what the integrations and things are. And you don't have to do that alone. Uh, and really uh, checking with your provider and checking with Squirrel. Uh, as to what they can provide and how you may get it done. They're getting to talk to a lot of people, which I think we just saw, and they can bring you those ideas as well that will help you to operate better. So uh, with that, I do want to thank you on behalf of the IFBTA and remind you that on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. we've been running web 2 p.m. East Coast, we've been running webinars. Uh, this uh, webinar itself will be posted on the IFBTA website and also be distributed uh, through our LinkedIn uh, social media and through Squirrel. And again, thank you, Squirrel, and thank you everyone for attending.